here. There we go. All right, so uh, your book's at the Beach Crew. It's the top of the hour. We're maybe a minute early, uh, but we're gonna get started. Uh, there's a whole bunch of you out there in the audience that uh, Jed, my co-host, and I have not met yet today. You saw Carrie Faust earlier today and Mimi, our camp director. Um, we're not going to see your faces this evening, but most of you are pretty practiced with Zoom at this point. Obviously, you can reach out to us via the Q&A, and Jed and I will kind of mind that for each other uh, as we're going on through. Uh, it is such a, a privilege to welcome Jim Richardson to us, uh, to the camp for our first chat with a pro. Uh, you know, we realized when we were going to go virtual, we had an opportunity to maybe do some replacements to reimagine some of these opportunities and to bring uh, Jim tonight, Larry Buchanan tomorrow, and John Horn on Monday night to you all, kind of after hours uh, above and beyond. Uh, well, Jim, again, welcome. We're glad to have you with us and all of you uh, out in the audience. Uh, thanks for tuning in tonight as well. Um, Jim, <laughs> welcome. Uh, you're coming to us from Kansas tonight. You were just saying uh, you, you, you make a home there in a, a small town. You, uh, when you were getting rolling, you were Kansas-based as well, and that took you right through to college, correct? Yeah, right, exactly. I, uh, but uh, I started out, I went to Kansas State because, well, uh, coming from a small town, I couldn't imagine anything else. Uh, so, uh, and, and uh, I went to a learning room country school, and so, yeah, I really came off the farm. You know, so, uh, so, yeah, but I, you know, but, uh, but I didn't major in journalism, by the way. I, okay. uh, I, uh, I, st I started, and by the way, hello, everybody out there. Thanks for, uh, thank you for staying up late with me. And uh, so we'll try and make this fun, okay? Um, I, um, I started out in electrical engineering and then I, uh, and then I switched my major to history and then there was something about music education and then there were about three or four more majors in there, uh, as, uh, as things went along. I, and then when I finally, I was majoring in psychology when I was a senior and I, uh, got to be the second semester of my senior year and I decided that, you know, I don't really want to do what a psychologist would do every day. Uh, going to work. So I went and got a job with a student newspaper. Mm -hmm. And I had, no, I had no journalism training before that or anything like this. I just got in there and then I started working for the, for the yearbook. And, um, and that was my on the job training, you know, uh, the Royal Purple, you know, that one, right? That's very well. Very well. Yeah. And uh, that's when it was a book, you know, that thick, you know. Um, and um, I, it was so it was on on the job and it was uh, reacting to things and uh, that was uh, 1969 so you know the the vietnam war protests were going on and it was a very heady time to be uh, doing things like that wow and, and to have you I, I i hadn't known the yearbook angle but you are definitely in the right place tonight man <laughs> we're, uh, we've got about 90, 90 people in the audience uh, and you are among uh, you're very much among friends uh, so, so thank you for that you know, Good. aside from the obvious, Jim, of, of working um, a, a few decades ago, that's not a, you know, a, a joke about age or generations at all, but the- Let's just, just count it as 50. Yeah, there you go, go ahead. <laughs> the, the, the technology and the, the hardware in our hands has changed so very much. Um, uh -huh. I, I imagine you could probably, you probably remember the first digital camera you got. You probably remember the first film camera, but that change up and the way that your work changed over the year can you uh -huh. unpack that for us just a little bit? A lot of these students listening may have not, I'm making an assumption, but may oh, not sure, ever enjoy sure. a film. Um, you yeah. certainly were in the, the heyday of it. But um, what was that change like for you professionally when you went over to digital? Uh, well, the, the switch to digital was, was instantaneous. I, uh, I mean, just to, to recount, um, I was doing a story on the Great Plains uh, uh, in, I think, 2002 and um, on film. And uh, I went and got a Nikon D100 to take along and uh, to sort of, uh, you know, experiment a little bit. And all of a sudden I started shooting with that and I saw, I saw the files, I saw what you could do. And that was it. And I said, I'm done with film, you know. And so there was, there was, there was no looking back. There's no nostalgia, there's no Kodachrome Envy. No, there's no, there's none of that. But uh, coming up through my career, no, I started um, on the farm when I started taking pictures. I was shooting on, on roll film, mm -hmm. you know, and developing it in the kitchen at night uh, out there on the farm. And then, um, of course, when I started the newspapers, um, it was all 35 millimeter black and white, the early Nikon F. And uh, 
all all those kind of things, you know. And uh, you know, you would you would come back on deadline, and you would have a uh, uh, you'd be I'd get back there twenty minutes before deadline, and you had uh, four rolls of film to develop, uh, and uh, and three prints to make uh, in a dark room in twenty minutes. So you you got really good at uh, good at these things. Um, I do remember that early on in my uh, in my career, I was pretty good at black and white, but I was horrible at color, and they wouldn't let me shoot color because I was so bad at it. And um, one day, somehow the light bulb went off, and I just thought, okay, so if you have color film in the camera, you find a subject that's one color and you fill the frame with the color and now you have a beautiful color picture. And it was kind of like, that's nuts and bolts, simple. No great philosophy, no nothing, you know, just that, you know. And, and now I'm probably known best for my color work um, uh, over, the, over the years. And then yes, the transition. But the, the, the transitions, those have been constant. Um, and they're going on right now and they will continue to go on. Those transitions of technology um, are not a one-off deal. No, they're, that's, just, that's just constant, and you just keep adapting and, and picking up, and, and, you know, and, and you keep your eye out for all the latest social media uh, platforms, the, the newest Instagram and, um, and whatever, whatever else. Anybody out there on TikTok? I imagine they are. Yeah, so <laughs> yeah you're in the right audience. Yeah, um, yeah. Jim, you brought up the point of, you know, the, the technology is evolving and we're changing with it. Um, tell us a little bit about your transition into, you know, away from DSLR or starting to incorporate iPhone and phone cameras. You know, I was on your uh, website this mm -hmm. afternoon uh, and you've got an entire section on iPhone uh, photos. How did that transition take place for you? Well, I, I, back at about the iPhone 5, <laughs> Uh, uh, how many generations is that back? Um, I um, I had been seeing already that that the iPhone could do pretty well, and I was getting ready to take a trip to Scotland, a trip that I had done before, and I just kind of thought, gee, what am I going to do different this time that I haven't done before? And that morning, I had gone into town and 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 bought the iPhone. I think it was iPhone six. And I was driving back and I thought, gee, why, not, why don't I do this whole trip on the iPhone? I'm just gonna leave everything, every, the digital SLRs, the, the real cameras, you know, I'm gonna leave them at home, you know, and I'm gonna just see what I can do. And, um, and that, that ended up, that was the iPhone 5 that I did that on because when they came out with the iPhone 6, they used one of my pictures uh, in the launch party with uh, with Steve Jobs up there uh, talking about it, you know, and uh, one of the one of the highlights of my career have Steve Jobs up there say, and Jim Richardson did this picture in Scotland <laughs> with the iPhone six, you know. <laughs> so so it was, yeah, but it was great fun. And 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 what it, what you what you realize is that whatever camera you have in your hand is plenty capable of doing lots of really good pictures. And the iPhone today is 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 a superb camera, you know. Uh, so so uh, there there's no reason, you know. I tell people when I do a, a an, uh, an iPhone photography workshop, you know, that the excuse that you don't have a good enough camera is gone. Mm -hmm. Yes, you do have a good enough camera. You you got your phone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. Uh, Mike and I have been preaching that at, at workshops for a couple oh, of years. Oh, sure. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's, 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 it's just great. Um, and this, this photo up on screen right now is an iPhone yes. of yours, right? Yes, it is. That's out at uh, String Lake uh, in uh, Grand Teton National Park. I was out there for uh, a, a photo workshop, you know. And, uh, everybody else was wh horsing around their tripods and their big cameras and, and being very serious, you know. Uh, I was out there with my little, my phone just kind of, you know, and, uh, and, uh, and doing this and yes, the, the quality is quite amazing. I, uh, uh, and, uh, the ability to, to be flexible and be in the moment, you know, be, be able to do things quickly, let alone just to be able to, 
to do a panorama and do uh, w whatever uh, is really quite remarkable. Yeah. Does of it ever go does, ahead? Yeah, yeah. Does it ever let you be more subtle and more sneaky, Jim? Oh, of course. Nobody knows that you're a professional. You're just another tourist with a with a with a phone camera. You know, um, uh, David Gutenfelder did um, no. Uh, he, uh, did this story on Tokyo. He walked across Tokyo, walked 50 miles, uh, and, and did this whole story on the iPhone. And of course, the huge advantage there was, you know, he's not walking around out on a city street with a big camera. Uh, he's, he's got a phone like everybody else does. And uh, so it, it, it really opens up things. It takes away a, a lot of the intimidation that uh, people feel when you, when you, uh, point a camera at them. Jed, do you think we can get into some of the questions? I saw somebody asked for this Tetons photo, Jim, if you recall which iPhone you used. And another question was, do you shoot through a third party app or do you use the native Apple software? Okay, so so I think this was probably an iPhone 8, um, something something like that. Um, I've, got a, I've got a 10XS Mac right now and I should have the latest, but I haven't done it yet. Um, each of those generations is somewhat better, so yeah. Um, but still, by the by, by the iPhone eight, you were getting to a right place. You had a really good uh, a really good camera. Do do I use? I still use. Okay, so here's a confession. Um, I carry at any one time. I carry between eighty and a hundred different uh, photo apps on my phone. Uh, so, and I actually do carry several of the. Um, of the uh, the camera apps like Camera Plus mm -hmm. and uh, and several others that are that are very good, uh, but typically I end up using the uh, the native app, and I just I just work around whatever limitations uh, there are um, rather than uh, than going anywhere any place else. Yeah. Excellent. And then um, maybe this would be a good time to to move into um, what's your process. Uh, on that uh, photo after you've shot it on your phone, are you mm -hmm. doing are you doing your post processing uh, as you're going on the phone, or are you then transferring uh, to do your post process on the computer? Uh, what's that look like for you? <laughs> no, I I uh, I I beat myself silly trying to do that. You know, especially out on a workshop or out in the field. Uh, you know, I'll be on some of the National Geographic cruises and you're on a ship, you know, and you don't have Wi-Fi and, you, you know, and you're trying to transfer pictures over to the, to the, the no, I just finally decided, nope, I'm going to do it in the phone. You know, I'm going to do everything in the phone. I'm going to process the pictures in the phone. I'm going to, I'm going to uh, import them into another app and do whatever toning I want. If I want to do a, a grunge filter or something like that, um, I do it all there. If I'm going to build them into Instagram stories in something like Unfold or Mojo or any of the other uh, uh, Story Lux or any of the other ones, I do it there. Uh, and I just, you know, there, there are some limitations, um, but you, you generally find workarounds uh, for them. And <clears throat> I find that, that living within the limitations takes less time than transferring them over to a computer mm -hmm. and and messing around with them there. Now, my digital SLR when I'm doing you know, I'm doing assignment for National Geographic magazine. Well, yeah, yeah, exactly. I like this one. This is uh, this is out on the Isle of Muck, and uh, this is the Laird of Muck. Uh, a Laird is a is a medieval lord. That's Lawrence McEwen, and he is actually he that is his island, and he is still, that is a uh, feudal land ownership. He is a medieval Lord. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But he's up there. And then that's out, that's out on his Island. The horses there going across. These were all shot on my uh, digital SLR on an assignment for national geographic <laughs> traveler. Yeah. Yeah. So same there. Yeah. Um, have you uh, question? We're, we're going to kind of jump around, and 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 I think it's okay. gonna be, I think it's going to be awesome. We're we're in great shape already. Um, one of the questions came up in the chat. They said, "Have you ever been somewhere or taken a picture where you just wanted to stay in that moment and absorb what's around you?" And and my that led to my own question of like, 
have you ever been, because this is your job, have you ever been so engaged? You know, I go to concerts, I see everybody doing their thing mm -hmm. through their phone instead of being present in the moment. Has yeah. being a photographer, have you, is there ever a photo you haven't taken because you wanted to appreciate that moment more? Oh, lots. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I hope, I hope nobody catches me when I'm supposed to be working, uh, just kind of sitting there, you know, uh, I can remember you know, little things, uh, sometimes, um, being with people, um, being out on one of the little islands in, uh, in Scotland, sitting there when the puffins were coming in and landing about five feet away from me. Hmm. Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, and, and it, here's the, here's the thing. I, I think that this goes to a deeper thing as well. Um, if, um, the photos are stronger, they have more meaning to me and usually they have more meaning to other people if they reflect a real experience. Hmm. So, so, so I tell people and I, and I believe it that the first thing you have to have is you have to have a real experience. You have to have a, a real reaction. You have to, you have to actually see the, see this thing. Um, and if you, if you have that, then, then your photography is directed. Then you're trying to do something. So you just went through three pictures there of that same horse, right? So the, 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 the one on the beach, uh, the, uh, the, the down low angle, then you do, yeah. And so those, said that's the front horse there. Okay. I'm sorry, there's only two of them. Yeah. So, so that one, you see the front horse with the gray. Okay. Go to the next one. Same horse, you know. And and basically what I'm what I'm doing there is I'm I'm trying to take that scene um, and work it, you know, because I've already had this sense, you know, immediately of oh my gosh, this is a great wild scene out here on this island, you know, there's this horses on the beach and uh, that island over there, that's the Isle of Rum, and the and the clouds are swirling around the top of it and all kinds of stuff. Once you have that reaction, then then your your photography is directed at trying to, to to create as many ways of seeing that as you as you possibly can in the in the moments that you have, yeah. But I think you you need that reaction. And so yes, if you have to kind of just you know, stop twisting the dials mm -hmm. a little bit and actually react to this place, then probably your photography is going to be better directed at, at creating something that you can then share with someone else. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Um, and we've got some Q and A's coming in kind of centralizing around some things. Um, mm -hmm. When you're, when you're in a situation where you, you don't have kind of that creative story going where you don't have that vision, what are some things that you might do in order to find your inspiration? Find your inspiration. Okay, well, first, I, I think the idea of inspiration as if, you know, lightning bolts going off in your head is, is overrated. Uh, knowledge is really useful. <laughs> understanding what you're seeing. You know, understanding what you're seeing. Relating it to real life, to emotions, to uh, whatever. Um, I, ha I had that experience when I was shooting those pictures uh, uh, for my book called High School USA, because uh, I spent three years in a small town high school, and I was um, I was trying to 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 uh, to to capture what was going on, and so uh, there you go, the High School USA, yeah, right. Uh, this was clear back in like 1979, so I started taking pictures there in 1976. Yeah, so so. So basically what I had to do there is I had to understand what was going on in their lives. So, uh, and, and once I understood you know, that, you know, for instance, here you have a picture, the, the, uh, the homecoming king and queen, you know, uh, getting, uh, or the, I think they're basketball sweetheart. Yeah. Okay. And, and they're standing in the middle of this circle of candles uh, you know, with a spotlight on them, and you think, oh, what an emotional thing for those two kids to be to to be in that in that position. Um, so I kind of have to understand that. I have to I have to get to where I understand that this is something for them, and 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 all. And once I once I do that, then I kind of that kind of directs me of where do I take the picture from? What do I show? How, what am I trying to 
What am I trying to get at? If that's inspiration, then okay, th fine. Yeah, uh, if you want to think of it that way. But I, I think of, uh, of it as more like learning the place, learning what's going on, and then trying to, to make images that will, will convey it. Well, and I, I think that gets more to what we try to teach our, our yearbook photographers, that it's not just that you show up and, and boom, it's going to hit you and the images will just be there. Um, so I appreciate that you talked about it. You've got to spend time. You've got to be uh, involved in the situation and learn to understand it sure. and sure. capture that. Um, and this this picture is is, a, is an example because oh my gosh here they were on the receiving line you know after after graduation and they're standing underneath the goalpost <laughs> you know and you think what is what a symbol you know there's 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 the symbol so uh, so and I and then I have this this handy thing if I get down low enough I can see the their their caps and gowns I can see the girl there. I saw this all, all in a class one day, and she's just totally bored, you know, just <laughs> absolutely out of her mind, stupefied, you know, and she's and you can see it in the way she's pulling the hair out there, and the guy up in the foreground got his face up, oh yeah. my God, you know? <laughs> and and it was just wonderful, you know, uh, these two guys, Andy and Jim, you know, and they had two corsages for the for the one for their date and one for their mother, you know, and it's just. It's just a picture of them, you know, in their whole identity thing. They've got their jacket on, they got their names, and it's it's all about trying to 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 be, have an identity when you're when you're a high school kid. You know, it's a hard thing to do. You know, and the the little, the little traumas that go in their in their lives. This was Rhonda Monholland, and uh, you know, everybody had a date except her. You know, it's kind of like. Uh, you know, and, and I mean, I remember that when I was in high school, it's, 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 it's tough stuff, you know, and I just wanted to, I wanted to be able to share that about, the, about their lives. Here was in the, they lost, can you tell? <laughs> yeah, yeah, they lost, yeah, they lost at the state tournament, uh, you know, it was, so a, you said it was this, a hard night. Uh, so this one was for a book, is that right? And I, I did that book then I, I called High School USA. Okay. And, and then Brandon, Brandon Life, pardon me? In about three years, you said on that project. I spent I spent three years going back and photographing uh, them. Yeah, this was the uh, the high school graduation, and you know, and the the color guard is there, and they've got class of '76 over there on the side, and they got the American flag, and we got a motto: "Is what can we do for our country?" Yeah, you know, that was the the John Kennedy uh, statement. It was it was just kind of like every little element was there, and all I really had to do as a photographer, all I really had to do, stand back and capture it all. You know, just kind of, kind of straight, straight on. Oh, this kid, he, he, uh, he tipped in a basket at the last second. You know, and it was the first time he'd ever done anything like this. You know, and and everybody is swarming around him, and it was he just. And then you know, and then what I did was when I did the book, I took those pictures back to them, and I asked them what was going through your mind mm -hmm. at that time. And so all of the captions in the book are quotes from from the kids. So they they could tell me what's going on in their minds because I didn't want to glue on what I thought was important to them. I wanted them to tell me what was important. Jim, I know I'm going to sound like such a, a, a fool and novice here, but I, I want to paint a picture for the 100 so uh, audience members. Mm -hmm. Again, many who haven't ever touched film. When you got this basketball shot, you had no idea in 76, 79 of walking out of there that night knowing what you got. You might have looked down and said, oh, that shutter speed was a little bit down. Maybe I didn't have that shot. But here he is, you know, as near to razor yeah. sharp as you can get back then. Talk to us a little bit about the differences then versus now. I mean, you can spray and pray and you walk away with a thousand shots <laughs> in half an hour. Well, you can still shoot a lot of film. I mean, right. you, you, but you were shooting 36 roll, 36 exposure rolls. So you always had to be like, you're coming up to this moment and knowing you can see that you're down to 15 seconds in the game. You don't want to be, you don't want to be at that point and only have two pictures left on the roll. So you would always be kind of calculating, you know, when, has when that are you going mindset to come forward to you, even though you're right. in digital now? Oh yes. But you know, I mean, whatever the medium you're using that has its, has its, its, its failure points okay. that you have to work, that you have to work around. So, but what were you, what, Basically, what you do, I mean, the, the, the motor drive on the camera that lets you shoot at five frames a second is the key on, on something like this. Because okay. uh, 
when we were shooting that, we could shoot at ISO, well, A, it was ASA at the time, ISO 1600. And it was barely usable, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and uh, so uh, you got a lot of blur in a lot, a lot of pictures. So you tried to make a, a virtue out of the blur, you know, and in that case it did. And then, and then hope to heck, I mean, you'd be there, I'd be there shooting that, hoping to heck that when I start, went back and started looking through the film, the next day, two days later, whatever, you know, that, that he'd be sharp someplace mm -hmm. in there in in some frame. So I might, I might have clicked off 20 or 30 frames there and, and hope that one would be sharp. One this the, was, those were strobes. I set up strobes in that gymnasium. It was I dark. Was in there. about that. Yeah. The strobe over here back, right? Um, yeah. We have a lot of students. Uh, I think Jed and I both have, have had to coach and mentor our students um, to, I say to my staff often, you know, when, when you walk into the chemistry lab, when you, you know, get near the, the locker room, whatever, you go to practice, you go to uh, behind the scenes for Beauty and the Beast on stage, you know, the first five minutes that you're there are going to be absolutely useless because everybody's going to be concerned with you, the photographer who's just come into the space. Mm -hmm. Granted, three years in, you were probably just like a, a, a window dressing or paint on the wall like they were like oh Jim's back I'm, I'm guessing unless you tell me different that they were used to you but can you talk a little bit about the ways that you you know approached a scene or a group an organization and gotten to the point where do, do they functionally ignore you and that yields then better coverage and better photojournalism because you just fade into the background what's that process like for you I don't think you ever actually totally fade in the background. I mean, people can't walk through you, so they, they still have to, they still know, know you're there. But you can normalize the experience with a, with a couple of things. One is you can just, <clears throat> you can start shooting pictures so that you don't, um, of, of many things. So that the one, they get used to the sound of the camera. Mm -hmm. if, if, that's a, if you've got a camera that still, still makes a, a loud click, you know. Um, so you kind of normalize that. Um, you also don't want to, to, uh, to, uh, telegraph to them what you think is important. So you, you need to shoot pictures of the important things and the unimportant things. Otherwise everybody's going to know, Oh, Jim's picking up his camera. He sees something important. So you kind of have to, you have to, to, to do a lot, a lot of pictures. Uh, and, and so you, you don't, let them know what you, what, what the really important stuff is. Because if you do, people will start reacting when you, when you do it. Um, the other thing you can do is um, uh, just be very boring. Just, just, you know, don't react. Just be, just be a bump on the log. It'll take them a while and then they'll start ignoring you. Right. You know, they'll just say, oh my, you know, if you engage, if you if you constantly engage, then it will all be about you engaging with them. Right. So 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 when people when you pick up the camera and people want to mug for the camera, they mm -hmm. want to they want to you have to you have to turn away. You have to you, maybe you shoot a couple of frames and then you go okay we're done with that you know, and uh, either you tell them that you're not going to do it or you just ignore them uh, and you go do something else. Right. And maybe you just kind of turn kind of boring and pretty soon people will go back to normal. Steve McCurry, the, mm -hmm. the famous photographer who did the Afghan girl, he did that a lot. He, he, but he would do it almost to, to the point that it was torture for people. He would, he would make them sit there for 45 minutes while he, while he just looked at them, you know, and finally they just kind of got this vacant look in their eyes and, and then he clicked the picture, you know? So, Yeah. Jed, I'll turn it back over to you. We've got a ton of stuff going on in the Q&A, too. We've seen, um, so we've seen some of your stuff from Scotland. We've seen uh, High School USA. Uh, mm -hmm. What has been the most challenging environment for you as a photographer? What's been the, the hardest place for you to, to do your work? <laughs> uh, well, I don't like the cold. <laughs> so I would say... Uh, I would say trying to do a, uh, a shot up in Arctic Svalbard of a, of a scientist holding tubes full of seeds in the, uh, in the uh, Svalbard seed bank. Um, and I, it was, uh, oh, about 20 below, and I'm out there 
with strobes going off, lighting him, and then watching over my shoulder for polar bears because the because it's famous for polar bears eating people. So maybe maybe that one, but it just in 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 general, you know, weather and bugs. You know, weather and bugs are probably the worst the the worst thing. Now that's that's in sort of the environmental uh, the right. environmental kind of thing. You know, yeah. The the real the real thing is you know the really tough part. The real kind of just pulling teeth kind of thing is when when you have a really when you have a great opportunity and you don't want to miss it you know and you and and you and, the, and it will really take a lot of work and a lot of logistics to figure out where you should be when and what you should be ready for and and uh, and all those those kind of things that's what worries me mm-hmm. you know just being cold that's just a pain in the neck uh, but uh, but but missing missing something, especially if I've spent a lot of money to get there, you know, if I if I've spent ten thousand dollars to get someplace, right? And I and I don't get the picture. Oh yeah, that's. But well, and that brings up a really good point, and it's it's something that um, we hope to emphasize with our you know photojournalists, our our young photographers, is um, the the components of the job of being a photographer that is not the time spent directly behind the camera. Uh, can you talk a little bit about kind of your planning process when you're leading into a project or you know, when you're getting ready to take that flight? What are sure some thing. of the things that you do getting ready? Uh, will do. By the way, that's an iPhone picture there. Uh, mm-hmm. So uh, out there uh, at that same lake that you saw, that's the that's iPhone there in, uh, in Times Square. Um, yes. the. So usually I would always figure that, uh, you know, an, 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 a National Geographic assignment might be three months in the field, uh, six weeks, eight weeks, 12 weeks, maybe. I would usually figure at least one to two days of research for every day in the field. Hmm. So uh, a, a day or two days back sitting in the office doing research on Google or whatever, uh, for every day that I would actually be out there holding a camera, so th- th- that's the that's the the ratio of uh, uh, of doing that. Particularly if it's a very difficult thing like uh, shooting farmers in in ten countries around the world and uh, all the places you have to learn where where to where to find the, find things, you know. Yeah. So so a lot of research, a lot of uh, developing a lists and database and uh, a, a shoot list of of things that I want to get and things that I need to get, you know, that, that kind of thing, a lot of it. Can you uh, talk for maybe just a minute um, for our young photographers about what that, that shot list is? Uh, mm. because that might be a, a new idea for a lot of them and something that they can take, uh, you know, into their yearbook work. Um, sure sure thing. About that. Okay, so, so, um, I, I did a number of books on colleges, and I'd have about three weeks um, at a at a college to photograph it, um, and I would uh, be trying to capture the the spirit of the place and the look of the place and the activities and and all that. So that would come down to a, a list of of um, you might not start out with a list of the places, the places where things happen. The places that are signature places that give the that give it their identity, you know, on a college campus that might be the statue of the founder, it might be the the football stadium, it might be the the classic bell tower, you know, um, kind of thing. In other words, a, li- a, a list of of places that distinguish this thing, this this area, uh, physically and uh, in its landscape, uh, and and show you what it looks like. What, what it looks like, what its character is like. Then you would have a list of activities, you know, a list of, you know, football games, tailgating before or after the, uh, uh, the foot go, football game, uh, cheerleader practice, band practice, uh, you know, marching band practice. Uh, you would just start in with a, a, and compile a list of all the activities. And then you would want to find out, okay, so when do they happen? And when do they happen and look their best, and so it would be that kind of a that kind of a list. The uh, key characters, uh, people, 
you know, who, uh, who, uh, who are the professors, who are the teachers, who are the, uh, uh, the, 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 the beloved people, you know, and that can be, that can be the principal and it can be the janitor. It can be anybody, you know, uh, the, just uh, whoever these, these, these characters are and what do they do and what gives them their personality? Now you'd want a list of those, those kind of things. So I might, in a, in a case like this, I might try and come up with a list of 20 places, 20 activities and 10 characters. And let me see what else, there would be other stuff, you know, but, but that gives you the, right. the, uh, the, the basic outline of it. No, that, yes. That's great information for, for these photographers to have. Now, when you're doing, uh, say you've got an assignment for National Geographic, mm -hmm. it, is that list coming from them or is that uh or is there just a they give give you a topic or are you taking those story ideas in the other direction where you're coming up with it and going to them usually i would try not all of them but but i would try about 70 percent of my stories were stories that i wrote the story proposal uh to them i i wanted to be the generator of the idea okay and i wanted to, <clears throat> this is selfish what I wanted to do was I wanted to I wanted to be sure that I was shooting a story that that was photographable, in other words, that had good pictures. Right. You know, because I could look like a better photographer if I was if I was out standing in front of interesting stuff rather than standing in front of boring stuff. So I didn't want to wait for the writer or someone else to come up with that list because they're bad at it. Uh, I wanted to come up with that list myself and I wanted to, from the get go to develop the whole, the whole structure of the thing so that it had good pictures. Okay. So then, then, then the next thing, by the way, so, so I can relate then sort of the next process after you've done that. The next thing would, would be to do is, is, is how you, how you think about it. And there's a, there's a little trick here that you can do. Um, say, uh, and I did this, I did a story on the Colorado River, you know, so rather than just so like, you know, getting in a canoe and starting down the river, you know, uh, this was a, this was a story about the issues around the Colorado River. And my old, uh, picture editor, Dennis Dimmick gave me the, the tip. He says, okay, so, so let us say you have, um, you're doing a 24, for our purposes, a 24 page story. In, in National Geographic magazine, that is 12 spreads. Two page spread, two page spread, okay? 12 spreads. Each spread is something you can say. It's a statement you can make. So what are the 12 things you want to say about the Colorado River? Hmm. Okay, so, and in that case, then you go, oh, okay, I see. Well, the water comes from high in the mountains. Um, the water is very valuable. Um, they build big dams to hold it back and store it up. Um, it all gets used up before it ever gets the ocean. Okay, I just did four of them there, okay? Great. Once I have those ideas, then I can start figuring out, okay, where do I go to photograph? And that, that thing, and that last one, it dries up before it ever gets to the ocean. There's actually a place down, if you go looking for it, you see, there's actually a place down in Mexico where the, the last of the water sinks into the sand and it never gets to the ocean because they've used it all up for irrigation and things like this. So there's an actual place. So I, I okay, I'm going to go to that place. You know, that's a good picture to have. I ended up shooting that from the air, but you could actually see that that was the end of the river. Yeah. So, so yeah, so I, uh, that's, that's kind of the nuts and bolts of the, process it's a real pain in the neck i can tell you but well, but, that's a, that's but your photography is much better yeah that's a great explanation of the process and Incredible. you know certainly something that our our yearbook kids can uh, hopefully take to heart as far as their process could be for for and you book. you can do that you can do that doing books you can do it use it doing yearbooks you can use it for television shows i mean that process is pretty translatable all across the spectrum uh, if, if you know how to do that. 
we talk about, and so many of the kids in the audience are um, in the process right now of doing their theme development of, of what is the book going to say next year. Um, and I'm thinking about the, the books that have multiple spreads to kind of set the stage and open the book. You're, you're blowing my mind when you're talking about you've got 12 spreads. What is the thing that each spread is going to say? I mean, I'm, I'm going to carry that with me for the rest of my time advising because, <laughs> you know, we, we so often get the volleyball spread, the homecoming spread, the, but shifting, maturing, making more sophisticated the approach, the planning we take with the journalism and saying, but, but what is this spread saying? It, it might not be appropriate for the car wash spread per se, but maybe the car wash spread is saying we are active in and giving back to our community. Sure. Um, you know, it, it can work that way. Um, Jim, I want to go back to iPhone and SLR. Um, you know uh -huh. what's coming. Don't give it away, please. I'm going to show two images. I'm going to show two images. Um, and okay. I'm going to put a poll out into the wild uh, oh, for good. All of you in the audience. So the next two images you're going to see, and again, Jim, don't give it away. Here's image one. And here's image two. And we'll go back and forth without the and the question is which one was shot with the iphone specifically the iphone so again uh we'll go back that's image one this is image two and without giving away the tech stuff and the the how uh, jim can you put us in this place and in this moment just a, a little bit of the backstory and appreciation sure this was uh it's a it's a little place called loch marie loch is a lake in scotland loch marie and it was perfect for our story on the Scottish Moors uh, because I needed, I needed to be able to show that, that a little, uh, the trees could grow on an island because deer couldn't get out there. Mm. That, was the, that was the whole point of this, this picture. We went back there three or four times and um, got some nice pictures. But on this morning, uh, this was, it was mirror flat. Uh, the light was beautiful. Um, it, it worked really, really well. This know? is picture and one again, and the longer one, the wider one, that's picture two. Um, are mm -hmm. there, you know, we, we were being maybe a little coy and, and a, a little bit uh, nudge wink on like, hey, you know, you, you've got your iPhone, you can sneak around, you're not a big pro photographer, you can be more subtle. Do you weigh up some of the trade-offs or do you take it now as a professional challenge? Do you say, mm, this is really an SLR story? Or is that kind of thinking, is that too simplistic and, and you're actually not even thinking of it that way at all? How, how do you judge it? I would be more like, yeah, I would be more likely to, to if, if, I mean, yes, if I'm, if I'm shooting for National Geographic, most of the time we're going to do that on a, a digital SLR, yeah. Um, there's, there's not a lot of reason not to for in most, in, in most cases, unless there's a, a specific reason to do it on the iPhone like uh, David Gutenfelder, you know, doing his walk across. Right. You know? So you might, you might, you might, you might come down, down to that, but largely, I mean, I've done any number of, of trips with national geographic expeditions, the travel, you know, cruises and uh, around the world, jet trips and things like this, where I just took the iPhone and I just, I just shot pictures, you know, and, um, and uh, the, the, the expedited, process, you know, very often more than made up for any perceived loss in quality. Now right. that was even two generations ago on, on cameras. Mm -hmm. The current generations are, are better yet, you know, and uh, so is anybody <laughs> voting yet? Yeah. Oh yeah. I was going to say, and you won't believe it. I mean, we've got 79% of the people have voted. I'll close it out here in a second. Um, it's razor thin. Last call. This is picture one. This is picture yeah. two, the slightly wider one. Again, picture one. Picture two, uh -huh. we're asking those of you in the audience at this webinar, which one was shot with the iPhone? Um, the, 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 uh, there are still some questions in, in, in the Q&A, Jim, about um, the apps and things you use and post. Do you oh, yeah. have um, any of those resources over at your website at all? We want to encourage the kids to go check out your, your, your professional page, your gallery, and the rest of that. Is, are any of that maybe in your FAQs and things like that? I'm not sure if I've got that in there. I'm okay. sorry, no, uh, no, but I could, I could, uh, but, but I tell you what, uh, here's, here's what you do. You do, do, do what I do every year. Okay. You go onto Google and you say 10 best iPhone apps yep. <laughs> for 2020. <laughs> and and you'll get a, else does that. <laughs> and you'll get a bunch of, you'll get a bunch of, uh, a bunch of different stories. 
But when you start seeing the same app show up over and over again, then you pay attention. Yeah. yeah. Hey, uh, we, so we need a drum roll uh, or otherwise. Here's the uh, the results share. Uh, razor thin, 51%. 51 to 49. To 49. So Jim, tell us true, uh, picture one or, or picture two. This is picture one. That's picture one. And Oh, you, uh, oops, you go that's ahead. Picture two. Wait a minute, that's picture two. Go back to picture one. Yes, sir. You lose. I'm sorry. You lose. That's the iPhone. Oh, wait a minute. The number one was the iPhone. So you win. All right. Okay, you, got you win. It. Okay. Got it. 51 You win. Number two was the... Uh, that was actually a Nikon D800, and that is a, uh, I mean, that's even better. That is an eight-picture panorama stitched together. <laughs> so, so this it's, is done in post. It, it is super high resolution. Yep. It is just super high resolution. Wow. What, what you will notice, what you should look for, what the difference is, is not in apparent sharpness at this size on screen. Sure. It is, it is the, uh, it's the contrast and the tonality of it. And I can't see it on the on my screen, but if you go back to the other one, yes, you'll see that that the that the light is is harsher there where the yeah. behind the uh, behind the tree where it's coming. Now, in some ways, that it's it's a little more dramatic, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, you you may actually you may actually like this better. Yep. You know, yep. at least at that at least at that size. And I must say that that's a twelve megapixel file. Yep. Um, I've made 16 by 24 prints from a 12 meg mm -hmm. megapixel iPhone camera and they look great. Yeah. This one though has, has, when, when you can blow it up and, and the National Geographic Fine Art Gallery sell this up to 30 feet wide. Wow. So when you can see it uh, 30 feet wide, yes, you can tell that there's a lot of detail in there. We want to, uh, I want to shift gears and be mindful. We've got about 15 minutes left or so. Um, <coughs> You talked about when we were looking at High School USA, um, working with people and uh, getting them to you know, be used to you in their space. What are some of the other advice that you would offer um, student journalists, uh, up and coming photographers, as it goes to um, developing a trust or uh, fostering access with people, with communities? Um, I think for our students, it's you know, how, how can I get close to the soccer team so that I can get mm -hmm. the story that we want to, to pursue. What's worked for you? What are some lessons that you've learned specifically about that? Maybe the human element, if we put it that way. Right. Yeah. Oh, the, I think, I think one of the things would, would be, um, to, um, uh, sort of, sort of be a person first and, and then be a photographer. So introduce yourself, learn names, um, Show respect. Do all do all the the, the basic uh, the basic things. In in a way, it's kind of like um, you kind of take the idea of objectivity and throw it out the window, and you become you become much closer and sort of part of the group. Now, mm -hmm. David Allen Harvey is a very famous National Geographic photographer, and and he always did these very intimate pictures of people in um, in other countries. You know, he'd go to Spain or Thailand or someplace and, and do just wonderful pictures. And then basically what he said he did was he said, I go someplace, I make a life for myself there, mm -hmm. and then I photograph that life. So, so it's no wonder that he's at the birthday party, you know, in Spain. That he was invited. You know, he's a friend. So, so you, you, can, uh, uh, you can do that. The second, uh, a second technique, however, uh, is take pictures back and show them. Mm -hmm. um, it's a it's a superb way of of building trust, because think think about when somebody's pointing a camera at you, you don't know what they're seeing. Right. It 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 makes you insecure because you You're you don't know it. You don't know if they're waiting till you, you know, you pick your nose or you, or what, you know, just, uh, they may be really out to get you and you can't tell, you know. So take pictures back, establish trust that what you're doing over time is really trying to tell their story, Yeah. you know. And I, I've had any number of people around the world, people who I could talk to, people who I just, um, uh, I didn't speak their language. They didn't speak mine, but but you could you could establish a rapport 
and especially today where you can take that you can take that picture then you can turn it around and say here you are you know that does an enormous amount of good uh in making people feel secure that 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 you're not out to get them right yeah and 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 i think as well <clears throat> i must say that in journalism yes there are times when there are real news situations, there are wars, and there are all those things, when we have to be the objective, hard-nosed person. But for the kind of things we're talking about doing here, I think being really part of the group and really understanding it uh, will go a long ways to making pictures that say more and share more about their lives. So yeah. Jim, we've been asked to actually, we got to transition because some of the advisors do need to get out to yet another meeting. Sure thing. Late night. Oh, yeah. um, I, I know I can speak for Jed and me both. This has been such a pleasure, such an honor to have you um, sharing these insights with our student journalists. Um, we're grateful for you making the time. Um, students uh, at Jim Richardson NG on Instagram and Twitter, both. Um, and Jim, maybe just briefly a plug for the Eye on Earth project that you're involved in right now, because that's available on Twitter as well. Maybe Instagram, you tell us. Oh, yes. And we, we, we have a website called, if you go to eyeson.earth, you'll, uh, you'll find us. And it's all about uh, the business of, uh, we're in the middle of climate change. We're in the middle of the Anthropocene. Um, for the next 30 to 50 years, you know, this is going to be recurring news around the world of how the earth is changing. We are, we are hoping to find a next generation of, of photographers who want to cover our environment and all those things that are going to be happening uh, during their, 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 the lifetime of their, their careers, you know? And it is going to be a, a huge story, perhaps the most important story the, of our lifetimes, you know? And, uh, it's just uh, a uh, a vital a vital thing. So keep your eyes open. Take a take a look at our website. But mostly, as you go into developing your your work and your uh, your career, keep all those things in mind. Awesome, Jim. Again, from all of us at your books at the beach, um, thank you so much for taking the time with us tonight. We really appreciate it. Really great to be here with you. Good luck, and you're all going to come and take my job away, aren't you? <laughs> yes, sir. Ah, okay, good. <laughs> thank you so much. You betcha, bye, Jay.